audio is an elementary component of any app and can range from simple UI feedback to complex real-time audio generation or manipulation. In this video we will go through the basics of audio programming with the Kiwi framework and a low-level audio library. At the end we will have an app which can let us play and manipulate a sine wave in real time. Let's get straight into it. First of all, we are using the Kiwi framework and want to deploy this app later on an Android device. This assumes that we require an audio library, which is also supported on Android. There are two low-level audio libraries for Python. One is AudioStream and the other one is PyAudio. Both are similar to use, but PyAudio is the better one simply because you will find a lot more help and a lot more examples on the internet. I've personally used it to create my own synthesizer. Unfortunately, iAudio is not supported on Android, so the remaining alternative is AudioStream. So let's first talk quickly about the theory and then continue with the coding. If you are already familiar with the theory, you can also skip this part and go straight to the coding part. To do real-time audio processing, we somehow need to manipulate the audio data in real-time. This can be, for example, changing the frequency of a sine wave. With tools like Audacity, existing recordings can be manipulated and effects like reverb can be added. But those effects are applied on the entire recording and they are not rendered in real-time. In other words, it would be not possible to play and manipulate the recording simultaneously. To do this simultaneously, we need to split the audio data in so-called chunks. As comparison, you can imagine the chunks to the individual frames of a movie. Those chunks can be as large or as small as possible. The smaller the chunks, the more reactive will be the applied manipulation of the audio signal. Any manipulation will be applied within a few milliseconds, which results in an overall more smoother audible experience. But this also results in a higher cost of performance because more operations need to be done in a shorter amount of time. In addition to those chunks, an indicator is needed, which remembers the current position in all those chunks. The indicator is necessary to render the sine wave and to create smooth transitions between the chunks. Otherwise, there are going to be discontinuities between those chunks, which are clearly audible. What does audio data actually look like? As an example, a sine wave is a collection of samples, which are decimal numbers between minus one and one. The more sample exists, the more precise the sine wave can be rendered. In technical terms, this is referred to as sampling rate. It describes how many samples are used to render an audio signal in one second. In the industry, a sampling rate of 44.1 kHz or 44,100 Hz are commonly used, which represents 44,100 samples per second. You can hear the difference between a higher and lower sampling rate, but at a certain point, this difference becomes barely audible. Back to coding. As my setup, I use Visual Studio Code from Microsoft, the Ubuntu subsystem, I'm actually coding on the Ubuntu subsystem and an app from the Microsoft Store, which is called GWSL. GWSL allows me to run graphical applications on the Ubuntu subsystem. I've made an entire video about this setup. You can find this link in the description. You also need to make sure that you have installed all libraries properly, like AudioStream and NumPy. I also provide all commands to install those libraries in the description. Now for this tutorial, we're going to use an example project, which we have created in one of the previous videos. You can find the link to this project in the description. We're going to use this example project and extend it with the audio feature. To manage audio, we will create an audio player class, which uses the library AudioStream. It is an independent class, which can be reused in different projects and it has the logic to render, play and stop a sine wave or any other audio signal, with some modifications to the code obviously. So let's have a closer look at our audio player class. In the constructor, we are initializing the engine, the body engine, by using the get output method from the audio stream library. There we set the amount of channels, the sampling rate, the buffer size, which is basically the chunk size and also the encoding. 
which can be, I think, 16 or 8. This function then returns our current used output device. It can be initialized only once, and if you want to make changes to the parameter, like changing the sampling rate, you have to restart your program. Next, we have the object audio sample, and this object handles the audio stream. It also has a function to write audio data to a ring buffer, to an internal ring buffer of the audio stream library. And the bytes on this ring buffer can be then played or stopped by calling the proper functions. Then we have here a set of variables. This is the indicator, which saves the position among all of those chunks. Here we just save the chunk size, the sampling rate, because we want to reuse it also later in a few functions we have here. And we are also saving the frequency for the sine wave. And this here, I will explain this later. Next, we have here a function to set the frequency of our sine wave. This is for Kiwi, so I can assign this function to widget in Kiwi, which is in our case, the slider of our application. In the main Kiwi file, i just show this quickly. We have here the slider widget to the on value attribute. We are assigning this function. So every time we move the slider, this function will be called and the frequency will be changed. The next function, render audio. This is basically where we actually render the sine wave. We have here the start position, the end position. This is again our indicator. For example, if we would now render the second chunk. This would have a value of, if the chunk size is, for example, 1024, the start position would be 1024, and the end position would be the start position plus the chunk size. So the end position would be, in our case, or in this case, 2048. In the next line, we are calculating the x values for the sine wave with numpy arrange, where we set the start and the end value. This basically gives us a set of values between start and end. This would give us, for example, if start would be 1 and end would be 10, all values between those numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And if we want to render a sine wave for one second, a sine wave which lasts one second has the x values between 0 and 1. To get those numbers, because this is only one chunk, in this one second, we need to divide our numbers here by the sampling rate because one second contains 44,100 samples. And in the last line, we just use the formula of the sine wave. So we use numpy.sine, two times pi times the frequency and times our x values. And then we get all the y values for the sine wave. And that's it. I'll talk about this function later. So here we have two functions, get bytes and write audio data. Let's start with audio data first. We are using our object or audio sample object, which has a function write. And this can write our Y values, which have been calculated to the internal ring buffer. But for that, those values need to be converted into bytes. For that, we have this method, get bytes. And this basically just converts the values in our chunk to bytes. And here we have a big method which contains all of those functions we have here. This is basically an endless loop with a condition that will stop if a flag, which is called plane, is set to false. Let's first start with the stream object here. The stream is our output device and we add the sample, the audio sample object to it. Then we have the audio sample object and we call the function play. This means when the audio sample object now writes bytes to the internal storage, to the internal ring buffer, those bytes will be automatically played. Here we have our indicator again in the loop. The first line, here we just call our render audio function, which calculates all the Y values. Then we increase the position and save the position to our indicator variable. Then we check if the current frequency is different than the old frequency. This is basically, I just demonstrate this. If we change the frequency, a new chunk is rendered. This also means there's a discontinuity every time I change the frequency. And this is clearly audible. You will hear a click sound. To prevent that, 
we are checking this and every time the frequency has changed we fade out the current chunk with a fade out function it creates values between one and zero and we set the length for it and then we take our signal multiply those numbers to the last n numbers of our signal in the next line we set the indicator to zero again and we save the current frequency to our variable old frequency when we are changing the frequency we are basically starting from zero again because it would make sense if we have position of let's say 1024 if we render a sine wave the sine wave always starts at zero but if the position is different it wouldn't start at zero it would start somewhere else and we had an additional discontinuity again and to prevent that we just set the position to zero in this line we simply write the audio data to the internal ring buffer and that's about it if the flag plane is false this loop will stop and we are going to write our last chunk we also are calling the fade out function render our last chunk again write it to the internal ring buffer again and that's it here i've commented out the line sample.stop which basically stops playing the bytes into internal ring buffer but what happens is it doesn't wait until a chunk is played so if you call this function it will stop right now what you will hear is a discontinuity again and which means you will hear a click sound again we prevent that just by stopping this loop and we call this write audio data function one last time with an fade out and here we have a function which simply changes the flag plane to false and that's all for the audio player class now you might have seen that this is a run function which indicates that this is maybe a function which is called by a thread and that's right we need to run this in an additional thread we have here an endless loop and if this loop is running everything else would need to wait for it which basically means the app would freeze until this loop is finished so we go back to our main python file in order to use the audio player class we also simply import it the file is called tools from tools we import audio player to use this run method in an additional thread we import the module threading and in the main add class we create two additional functions init thread and exit thread in init thread we create a variable which is called playback thread this is only to play the audio we are assigning our run function to this thread so we set target equals self dot app dot player dot run we also in the main grid class we create an object of our audio player class we set also the variables the parameters and we assign it to a player variable so then we can access the audio player class in our app in the next line we set our playback thread as a daemon thread we just call this function set daemon and set it to true this means it won't wait for the main thread all the kiwi code is running in the main thread and if this is set to false we couldn't close the app while the audio is playing what happens is i think the main thread is waiting until the loop is finished but because it's an endless loop it never finishes so the main thread never finishes and this whole program is just freezing so we can prevent that by setting this playback thread as a daemon thread and then we can close the app even if we are playing a sound right now after that in the next line we start our playback thread here we have just some console outputs each thread has an individual id so we can just follow the progress of this program and simply be shown by printing out this native id attribute also the main thread has a native id in the exit thread we simply call the join function of our playback thread which is telling the thread that it should end and here we have again this console output 
that shows the native ID. Here we can make sure that the proper thread has ended. So if I run this and add the frequency, play it. Then my playback thread has an ID of 1972. It has started and we have here the ID of our main thread and it has stopped when I was pressing the play button again. So here we can be sure that this thread isn't running anymore. We hit the play button again. A new thread will be initialized. Okay, here's the bug. So I figured out why this app is freezing. I've mentioned before that we don't use the stop function of our audio sample object. If we are using it with threading, or with a thread, it's actually necessary because otherwise new threads can't be initialized and this app starts to freeze or even crash. So we uncomment this line so we don't need those three lines here anymore. This will obviously create a click sound. If you press on the stop button, you will hear a click sound. But that will solve the issue with the freezing. So we can stop and start the audio as many times as you want. Now we need to call those thread functions. We have here a function which is called play results. And as you have seen, we have already added a play button in the main Kiwi file. Let's have a quick look at that. I created an additional box layout widget, set the padding, set the size, and inside of the box layout widget, a toggle button widget. We have it in ID, play, set the text to play, if it's released, it should call the function play result. This function here, we have a simple check, which checks the state of the button. If it's down, the text of the button should change and it should run the init thread method, which initialized playback thread, which then calls the run function of our audio player class. If we click on this button again, the text should change again and we call the stop function in our audio player class which simply sets the flag playing to false and if the flag is set to false the loop will end and we also call the exit thread function which stops the playback thread and because our widget is a toggle button which means if we press one time it stays on the state down and if we press another time on this button the state is not down anymore it's i think up this is how it works the way we are creating those smooth transitions between the chunks is very simple and right now it doesn't work so well that's why if we for example change the frequency with a slider very quickly we will still hear some click sounds just to give you an idea how you can solve this there are a few ways how you can create smooth transitions. One is, for example, linear interpolation. I've made an example here. We have here basically two sine waves with different frequencies. By using linear interpolation, we can make a smooth transition from one waveform to another. They can change their frequency in real time and we still get a very smooth transition and this should eliminate the click sound. To create the APK file, which we can then deploy on an Android device, we need to use the build tool Buildoser. I've made a separate video about this, where I go step by step through this workflow. I also explain how you can debug your APK file while it's running on your Android device. So I've already deployed the app on my Android device, where I can launch it. There it is, and I can change the frequency, zoom in, and also play the sine wave. That's it for this video. If you want to know more about Kiwi, then you should check out my other videos. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.